Hi everyone, in this video I want to go over the solution to problem number two from the 2014 AP Physics C Electricity and Magnetism AP exam. This is a standard type of motional EMF slash Faraday's law problem and students should expect that in many years they will come across this type of problem when magnetism is emphasized. So in the situation here, we have a rectangular loop of wire of resistance R traveling at initial velocity V0 toward the right into a region of magnetic field of strength B directed into the page. And the subsequent questions ask for derivations or explanations of different proposals about what's going to happen to this loop of wire. So in part A, letting X represent the position, place a check mark in the appropriate box in each column in the table to indicate whether the speed of the loop increases, decreases, or stays the same as the loop moves toward the right in those different regions. The regions being um, L less than X less than 2L, where X is denoted as the where X is denoted as the position of the right end of the loop. So in other words, where L is less than X less than 2L, the loop is um, just starting to enter the loop. It, it's not completely, or sorry, it's just starting to enter the field. It's not completely immersed in the field, but it is entering the field. And then 2L less than X less than 3L is a situation where the loop is completely immersed in the field and it's not leaving the field. It's still moving to the right, but it's still completely immersed in the field. Then 3L less than X less than 4L is where the loop is leaving the field. Part of it's in the field, part of it's not in the field. And then finally 4L less than X less than 5L is where the loop is completely out of the field and moving toward the right of the field. So the question is whether the speed of the loop increases, decreases, or stays the same as the loop moves toward the right. So I am using weasels to indicate whether the speed increases, decreases, or stays the same in these regions. So let's take a look at the explanation for this. So when the when L is less than X less than 2L, that is when the right end of the loop is between L and 2L in this diagram, the loop is still entering the field. Well, what's happening? That means that there is an increased magnetic flux into the page inside of that loop. Well, Lenz's law tells us that nature doesn't like changes in magnetic flux, so there is going to be an induced EMF resulting in an induced current that is going to result in an induced magnetic flux or magnetic field in this case out of the page inside that loop due to the induced current. What does that mean? That means that that's going to be an induced current toward the counterclockwise direction. You can use various versions of the right hand rule mnemonic to convince yourself of that. One would be grabbing the bottom part of that loop with your thumb pointing in the direction of that current and you notice that the magnetic your fingers are curling up into um, the loop from underneath that is out of the page, which is exactly what you would expect. So that means that your thumb pointing in the direction of the right at the bottom of the loop, meaning counterclockwise current, is correct. Same thing would happen if you grabbed it at the top of the loop with your thumb pointed toward the left because your fingers would be coming out of the page. Now, between the right end of the loop being between 2L and 3L, nothing's changing. There is no change in magnetic flux, so there's not going to be any induced current, so there's not going to be any change in speed. And the same thing is going to happen between 4L and 5L because there is no change in magnetic flux. However, between 3L and 4L, with the right end of the loop being between 3L and 4L, well now you have a decreasing magnetic flux into the page. Well, nature doesn't like changes in magnetic flux again, so that's going to generate an induced uh, current that's going to be, in this case, clockwise, that's going to cause an increase in um, the magnetic flux into the page to counteract that decrease due to the loop's motion toward the right. Well, what do these changes mean? These changes mean that when you have a counterclockwise um, current in the when x is between 2L and 3L, that means that the part of the loop, the right part of the loop, is going to have a current going upward. Well, an upward current, 
I vector cross a magnetic field into the page. Remember, F equals I L vector cross B vector. So either I vector or L vector is what you can think of as the vector. I'm actually going to think of L vector as the vector. So L vector pointing up, magnetic field into the page. L up cross B into the page means that the force is going to be toward the left, which means the speed is going to slow down because it's already moving toward the right. Meanwhile, later on, when x is between 3L and 4L, you have a clockwise current, and that means that you have the left side of the loop having a current up, and you still have an L up cross B vector into the page, meaning a force to the left. Now what about the tops and bottoms of the loops? Well, those do experience magnetic forces, but they cancel. So you don't need to worry about the tops and bottoms of the loop because those magnetic forces cancel. Now, drive an expression for the magnitude of the current induced in the loop as its right edge enters the magnetic field. You can either think of this as a motional EMF problem or as a Faraday's law problem. Um, you're going to get the same result. It's essentially going to be the same math in the end. So thinking in terms of Faraday's law, we're going to work in terms of magnitude. So slap absolute value bars around that um, d flux d time. So the magnetic flux is a vector dot b vector. Well, what is a vector? A vector is the area vector of the loop, but the area vector points in a direction that is normal to the loop itself. So we can think of that as either being out of the page or into the page. Um, it really doesn't matter because we're worried about uh, the magnitude anyway, but we can think of it as into the page for this problem, and the B field is into the page, so they're pointing in the same direction, so A vector dot B vector is just the product of the magnitudes of the area of the loop times the magnetic field strength. So the induced EMF is DDT of A times B. Now, what does that mean here? The magnetic field is constant, but the area of the loop going into that is having a magnetic field through it is not. So the B is able to come out of our time derivative, but the area of the loop, hmm, what is that? What is the area of the loop? Well, we don't care about the area of the whole loop here. We, carry about, we care about the area of the loop that is receiving a magnetic field. Well, that's going to be equal to, well, the base of the loop, in other words, the amount of it that's into the field, that's X, times the height of the loop. The height of the loop is L over 4. So L over 4 is constant, so that's going to end up coming out of our time derivative as well. So what we're left with is this dist distributes through, and we have a dx dt. Well, I know what dx dt is. That's called v. That's the speed at which the loop is moving at any time. So this is a general expression for the induced EMF in our loop. Well, they're not asking for the induced EMF. They're asking for the induced current. They're not asking for it at any particular, at any general time. They're asking for it at the beginning. Well, at the beginning, the speed of the loop is v naught. So the induced EMF is, I'm calling it script E0, which is BL V0 over 4. Current is given by Ohm's law, I equals script E over R, so just plug in that expression, divide by R, and we have BL V0 over 4R as the value of our induced current. Now, going back a little bit to figure out where our points are distributed in the chart, if in part A, you got one point for selecting the decreases for both of these areas um, when the loop is entering the field and when the loop is leaving the field. And you got one point for selecting that the speed stays the same when the loop is completely immersed in the field and when the loop is completely out of the field. In part B, in that derivation, you got one point for um, a correct equation to solve for EMF. The example that they gave was Faraday's law. And they had the minus sign, but in truth, we really didn't need it. In fact, they were, in the next line, they put absolute value bars around their expression. They gave one point for a clear indication that the area is changing. That would be in the DADT expression that we ended up having, which ended up uh, turning into an L over 4 DX DT for us and one point for relating EMF and current. That's called Ohm's law. And then one point for the correct expression for the current that we got, BLV0 over 4R. Moving on to part C. What is the direction of the induced current determined in part B? Well, 
and the direction is counterclockwise, as we mentioned in our justification in part A, and the justification giving as the loop moves toward the right, the magnetic flux into the page is increasing, so by Lenz's law, a current is induced to impose this change by inducing a magnetic field out of the page through the loop. So to produce that, we need a counterclockwise current to give us a field out of the page from our induced current. So you can verify that, again, with the right-hand rule mnemonic. I should mention, don't just say, by the right-hand rule. That will get you epsilon credit, where epsilon is arbitrarily small. But the points that they gave, they gave one point for selecting counterclockwise and one point for correct justification. Examples that they gave, they said as the loop enters the field, more of the area is in the magnetic field directed into the page. By Lenz's law, this increase in flux will create a current with an opposing magnetic field that will be out of the page. Thus, the current must be going counterclockwise. Another example, as the loop enters the magnetic field, the combination of the magnetic and electric forces on the charges on the right side of the loop will create a potential difference at the right side, with the top being positive. This will cause a current to flow in the counterclockwise direction. I think the first explanation it makes a little bit more sense in terms of um, directions and everything. Now part D, write but don't solve the differential equation for the speed v as a function of time as the loop enters the field. Well, we have our FILB equation, f vector equals i l vector cross b vector, where i, we already calculated that, that's b l v over 4 r, and the direction is 90 degrees because again the top and bottom of the loops do experience a force but those forces cancel the top, thinking a counterclockwise uh, current so at the top you have an i cross b that's going to be a downward force at the bottom you're going to have an i cross or l cross b and that's going to be an upward force so those directions end up canceling the only one that actually contributes is on the right side of the loop the left side of the loop doesn't contribute at all because there's no b field there so anyway we note that that force is to the left, so we slap a negative sign in front of there, and we plug in for our I. We also plug in for the fact that this L, this L is the amount of L that's actually receiving this, this force, and that's L over 4. I, I should probably call this, uh, yeah, the lowercase L, the amount of lowercase L receiving the force is uh, big L over 4. So that ends up working out to be a force of negative L squared B squared V over 16R. Well, what is force in general? Well, Newton's second law tells us that that's F equals MA, or M times DV DT. Now we have our differential equation, and we're done. There's no need to take this any further by isolating for DV DT or anything like that. Now, if they did ask you to solve this differential equation, then you would solve this by an easy separation of variables. You'd multiply both sides by DT, you'd divide both sides by V, you'd integrate, you'd get a natural log expression, you'd apply whatever boundary conditions are present there, and you'd be able to get your overall expression. Where did they award points here? So on part D, they gave four points here. One point was given for a correct expression of Newton's second law. Yay! We substituted an MA for our F. One point was for a correct expression for the magnetic force. That was our FILB equation. One point for substitution of variables into a correct expression for the net force, including a substitution for I consistent with the answer for part B. So yeah, even if you got part B wrong, just substituting whatever you got for I, hopefully it wasn't zero, ended up getting you this point. And then finally, one point for the final answer. In fact, actually, I should correct myself on that. That one final point was not for the final answer. It was simply for substituting A equals DV DT. So um, the actual final answer did not get a point. Now, what about part E? What is the direction of the acceleration of the loop just before its left edge leaves the field? Left, right, up, or down? So the answer is to the left, and the justification there, we actually already discussed that in our uh, justification, which wasn't required with part A. Um, one, we could just reference a Newton's second law, and the fact that since it's slowing down, uh, consistent with part A, that means that the force must be to the left. So a cleaner justification, after all, maybe you didn't get part A right, would be that by Lenz's law, 
we recognize that the current is clockwise in order to generate an induced magnetic field into the page to counteract that decreasing flux into the page. So that means, well, again, the top and bottom parts will experience forces that cancel. The right part is out of the field, so that experiences no force at all. The left part is what's experiencing the force. So that means the current there is up, so up vector cross into the page vector is left vector. So that's going to be a force to the left, which by Newton's second law means an acceleration to the left. They gave three points for this. One point for selecting left, one point for correctly stating that a clockwise current will be induced in the loop, and one point for correctly applying the right-hand rule to the current field and resulting force of the loop. Interestingly, even though that one point is essentially for applying a right-hand rule, they gave no credit at all if you selected the wrong choice, even if you ended up using the right-hand rule um, or uh, coming up with correct results. So they, those can be brutal on those answer justification problems. Where did people go wrong? So the official AP scores remarks says the question was a standard loop moving with a constant magnetic field, moving into a constant magnetic field, students are expected to know that there will be an induced EMF resulting current and force on the moving loop. The question gives the student multiple opportunities to demonstrate this knowledge first by just making correct selections from choices, then using equations, then describing in words what is happening. I think that is a lie. If you um, did there's multiple opportunities. Um, that's not true. If you did not make correct selections, then you missed those parts entirely. So in any case, how well did students perform on this question? The mean score was 5.28 out of a possible 15 points. What were common student errors or omissions? One, students tried to incorrectly use Ampere's law. Two, students commonly related the quantity BLV to current rather than EMF. Um, it's good to know that BLV is also the equation for motional EMF. Three, students often use the area of the loop instead of the rate of change of the area. Remember, it's the magnetic flux that we really care about there. Four, students often justify a result by restating the result rather than using correct reasoning. And then, based on experience grading, what message would you send to teachers that might help them improve? Students need more practice with justifications. So they've really made a big deal out of this in the non-calculus-based AP Physics courses, but they're starting to get into it in the calculus-based AP Physics courses as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, if anybody has any questions on this, please let me know in the comments section, and thank you for watching.